Crossroads Media. Yo, 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 real quick, it's the week, it's the week of Coffee with Pros. You thought I was going to say opening day. Well, it kind of ties together here. On March 28th, Thursday, 11 a.m., Coffee with Pros is back. How do you get access to it? Easily. Link is down below in the description. Join the community page here on Broads Media for $4.99 a month. You get access to Coffee with Broads every Monday and Thursday morning at 11 a.m. And also access to our Discord channel. The link is down down below in the description. Thank you all so much. I love you to death and enjoy the show. Wow. Wow. It's actually the week of opening day. Congratulations, everybody. We finally made it here. And unfortunately, it doesn't come without any negative news because on Saturday night, I put together a game plan and I put together a show sheet, show prep for a four or no, excuse me, a three hour show Saturday night. And I was going to talk about Tortorella and I was going to talk about what was happening with some of these other coaches in the city until on my drive in, I had to essentially throw everything out the window because Taiwan Walker was going to get an MRI and he probably wasn't going to start the season on time. And that's exactly what we heard. And while your initial reaction might be, so what, he sucks anyway, he did eat over 170 innings last season. And for whatever reason, they were able to win games when he was on the mound. Now, I don't think he particularly pitched well to have all of those wins. Obviously, the numbers speak for itself, but it was really just about that first inning. He was sniffing over a 7 ERA in the first, and then he's able to slow the game down and get more comfortable from there. So if there was just a possibility of smoothing out the start of his games, then maybe we're in a whole different world for the Taiwan Walker experience, and that still stands true today. It just won't happen at the start of the season, but my point of bringing it up is you have to replace 170-plus innings. I mean, that's very important. 173 innings is not something that you can close your eyes and just find. And is the answer Spencer Turnbull? I don't know. I mean, he's been through a lot of injuries in his career. Last year with the Tigers, we're only talking about seven starts. So I'm not telling you he can't be strong. I think what's going to happen is someone's going to step up that we don't necessarily anticipate. I didn't think Jeff Hoffman would be Jeff Hoffman last season. I didn't expect. Who else did I not expect? Christopher Sanchez. There's no way in hell I would have projected him to be a lefty that I enjoy and thinking of an off speed pitch makes me moist okay so there's something to the Christopher Sanchez experience and I would have never thought of that in a million years prior to me falling in love with his play so with that said who can it be maybe it is Turnbull maybe it's somebody who I don't even know maybe they get so desperate they have to reach out to Mick Abel a little premature but then he ends up stepping up to the bigs and being an awesome weapon I don't know that's probably third fourth fifth on my list of things that could potentially happen, but my overall point is I do expect it to be someone because we're under the Dave Dombrowski era here. It seems like they got a good, uh, you know, a good grasp here on the franchise, and they find guys like that. So we'll see what ends up happening, but it does suck that the start of your season is already kind of getting hit with some injuries, and you're not the only team now, right? So we can't feel sorry for ourselves. Garrett Cole, the New York Yankees, that's significantly more of a huge kick in the testicles than anything we're dealing with. But here's where I have a little bit of an issue with the front office. And I was saying this prior to the news that he had a shoulder injury. Even when healthy, with Taiwan Walker available for you, you figured it would be a great idea to speak with Yamamoto to the point where you had more money on the table than the Dodgers. And oh, by the way, you had Bryce Harper sit down and create some sort of package where he's involved in the package. So you were clearly understanding that you could improve your starting pitching and you weren't as satisfied as you were saying publicly. You were still on the prowl. So knowing that you were still on the prowl when healthy... What do you think about your squad now? And if you actually want to take down the Braves 
for the NL East and win the damn division over the long haul. I'm not talking short series. I'm not talking Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola in the playoff. That's a different monster. But if you're going to catch up 13 games, 14 games, and beat the Braves over the long haul, you definitely do need a fifth starter, and it needs to be more than a bullpen game or a Spencer Turnbull. I don't know. Can you go with Matt Straw maybe for two winning? So it's essentially a bullpen game, maybe three innings, squeeze some more juice out of him, or is that going to take away from what some of the MLB stats are telling you, which is this is one of the greatest bullpens in all of baseball. The Phillies are landing in on the number one spot, and the reason I think that's a little flawed is, let's be honest, bullpen pieces are so up and down, every single season, somebody is different. All right, David Roberts in one year to the next year, different different guy. Um, although he's made a hell of a career as a reliever, a late reliever. Longevity that he has had. But anyway, my point is, these guys go through a, a, a change of scenery. They struggle in one town. They go to a different town the following year. Okay, not uh, not the same way it played out the, the season where they struggle. They actually do well. It's very flip-of-the-coin level of stuff. So I don't know. I can't really believe that this team has the number one bullpen in all of baseball. And maybe it's more just because I'm scarred from that season and everybody knows exactly what world I'm talking about and what year I'm reflecting on when I say that season because I wanted to throw up every night every night I swear to God it hit 10 15 the game was wrapping up and I got my fingers down my throat trying to puke because I need to get that disgusting crap out of my fucking mouth when I would watch no matter who it was it doesn't matter who it was they would get smoked. And then, I mean, you could go through the list of guys throughout there. Remember David Hale? You had to deal with David Hale! You had to, I mean, the, Jesus Christ, the list, seriously, I mean, Hector Neris was a part of that failure as well. And I'm a Hector guy. My God, the things I do to have Hector the Protector back in those pinstripes, damn it. I'm all for it, but unfortunately he was a part of the equation at the time. Ew! 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 You made the move with, was it uh, he, um, who was it from Boston? And he actually Brandon Workman. Oh my God! And then they got Hembry in there as well. No matter what guy you put on, he'd blow the lead. He'd blow the save. Oh, it was terrible. And because of those times, you think I'm seriously going to go all in on a claim that they got one of the? I know it's not the same people, but I, come on, that's always drilled in the back of this noggin of mine. But anyway, look. The point of bringing up they were clearly interested in Yamamoto is go get Jordan Montgomery. If you want to be serious about this, if you actually want to support your claim that you want to win the National League East, then you have to improve your starting rotation. And now, guess what? There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of people that are going through their experiences of injuries. So they're going to try and get something going. There are some reports out there that now some longer-term contracts are in play multiple teams are picking up the phone and checking in to some degree there are some interests and the Phillies is a team that is part of that equation that doesn't surprise me whatsoever but go do it go do it and I keep getting this message about Trevor Bauer he had a decent little day against the Yankees there pitching for a Mexican team I believe somewhere in Mexico if I read that properly and I don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with it. I want nothing to do with it. That's my final consensus on it all. I just don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have it be the main focus of the season because whether you want to admit it or not, the second that guy signed here, then that becomes the narrative. No, no, no. Good things are happening with Price and Schwarbs and Trey and Stodd and Boom. And if you you want to improve your rotation in my eyes there is a way to do that where you don't have to bring in that outside noise go get Montgomery 
He is so good. He is such a veteran, poised, and there's no outside drama surrounding him. That would be a better option. There's ways to get a great starting caliber pitcher without the Trevor Bauer noise. So for me, it's a no-brainer. And I'm not going to pretend like I know the ins and outs of everything that's being done through the legal process and this and that. Okay, well, he didn't end up getting in trouble with this. and then, But now there's some other people saying that other things are happening. And if you would have thought that he got all free, right, and there were no charges, there was nothing happening in the legal world, then why isn't he signed yet? There's a reason why. All right, for whatever reason, there's a reason why I am not touching it. It's super sticky. Get me away. Go get Jordan Montgomery. It's that simple. Go open up your checkbook even more, John Middleton. He claims he wants his damn trophy back, and he'll be doing anything, and he's very willing to do it. Well, then now is the time to make your actions actually speak even louder than they already have. And he's for sure definitely paying a lot of guys and willing to fat, fat paycheck it up. But let's go with Jordan Montgomery, something that can get him here and in a rotation that is right on the money. Could you imagine? Imagine having to face Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola, and Jordan Montgomery. And then, by the way, Ranger Suarez. And there's your top four pitchers. That absolutely puts you in the category as one of the best starting pitchers, uh, the starting pitching rotations in all of baseball. I mean, I thought that when they had Walker. Seriously, and not because of Walker, but I'm just saying, having Wheeler, Nola, Ranger, Walker, Sanchez, when you look at a core five and you compare that to the rest of the league, that's absolutely up there, whether you want to admit it or not, but it is the truth. And if you had a Montgomery, I mean, come on now, fellas. That's exactly what you need to do if you're assessing how to get better, how to improve, and how to make this the best team possible to put the best roster on the field. Now, are they doing that out in center field with Rojas? I have no idea the plan with Pache and Rojas. Rojas is hitting about 170 in spring training this season. Now, he did very well in the regular season before the playoffs last year, and this is something that I'm not going to stand for, okay, because I constantly hear it out there. It doesn't matter about your nine-hole hitter, and one time I used to feel that way. There's no doubt about it that I was once in that position where I wasn't putting as much of an emphasis on your nine-hole hitter and how well they hit because, well, you paid Schwarber to hit the home runs. You bring in Bryce Harper not just for ticket sales and merchandise, but because he can smack around a 300 batting average and be an MVP. That's why you do it. So with Castellanos, Bryson Stott, Alec Bohm, why are we wasting time with your nine-hole hitter? Well, last year's playoffs happened, and you lost fourth inning, bases loaded. That decision costed you to keep Rojas in the game, and that hurt you. And you don't know who it's going to be. You don't know when it's going to happen, but Matt Stairs is epic for a reason. Matt Stairs and his home run, sometimes you need role play and bench pieces to be it, to be what happened. That's the momentum changer. That's the the game-changing play. It might end up being your nine-hole hitter. And I guess, look, you could say, well, they, they just made the wrong decision. They had to just take Rojas out of the game so they, they could still have Rojas in play, still have Rojas on their roster. They just have to improve their decision-making on the fly and not stick to their guns with Rojas and be worried about the defense, and, and that's fair. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely 1,000% right. That's why I don't think that this is a disaster by any means because as long as other pieces are perfectly in place and you have other options on your bench that would make you feel more comfortable, then absolutely – it, it changes. Rojas, though, I don't believe is ready. I don't believe is ready. That nine-hole spot matters, though. And it, especially if you're hitting before Kyle Schwarber, that goes a long way, too. But no, Rojas is probably a little too quickly involved, and I think that he should probably develop himself more. I understand that he's a, quote, elite defender, but Christian Pache, I mean, they're both right-handed bats, so where's the platoon? And if you're telling me Brandon Marsh, 
I, I, I don't like that idea because at that point you have a lefty-righty and then maybe Whit Merrifield plays left field more than we project him to because they want to get the veteran bat in there. Maybe he ends up actually being pretty solid for you and, and more than just a role player. So is there something to that? But then Pache and Rojas are, are almost identical. Pache a little bit of a step down defensively, but I think as a bit more to his offensive game right now. And Brandon Marsh, I think, needs to play every single day. Maybe he does out in left field. And then center field is just two right-handed bats that are almost the same. It's not adding up to me. I feel that's very bizarre. What else was bizarre was the reaction to Jake Cave getting traded to the Rockies. People were acting like this guy was one of the most dysfunctional baseball players of all time. By no means do I think Jake Cave was good, but the dude was a bench piece that hit about 220, that hit about 215, 216, 217, two, and that's not lighting the world on fire by any means, but he's just sort of a bench guy. He's a replaceable bench guy. The the reaction on social, get him out of here! The replies on the Phillies Twitter feed saying, boo! Uh, boo? You're wasting energy on Jake Cave? A bench guy who hit about 215, 220? I don't know. I just think that that's sort of just a blah bench guy, but I don't know. If you do research, I'm just going off the top of my head, there's probably 220 hitter bench pieces all around Major League Baseball Okay, move on from him. That's fine. I just don't feel that he deserves that level of passion where you hate Jake Cave. What am I missing where we despise Jake Cave to that level where he deserves this reaction of negativity? I right, uh, see you later. That's all. That was my re- all right. Go, all right, Jake Cave's out of here. Okay. Now what are they gonna do with a with a left-handed stick in the outfield? That's why I brought up the Brandon Marsh thing. Yes, I think that that's something that Dave Dombrowski also has to look to acquire. But all right, Jake Cave's gone. Okay, all right, what do I know? Um, Brogdon here did not have a great spring, so we'll see what the Connor Brogdon experience provides. Obviously, we know about his changeup. We know what he's able to do there if he puts it all together, but you just don't know exactly if you're getting the disgusting, hideous version of Connor Brogdon or one that's ridiculous because there is a ridiculous side to him. He just hasn't really been able to get everything rolling and just finding that confidence. I thought he lost it in his headspace a bit, and once you lose it in your headspace and you don't feel that groove, you don't feel that comfortability on the mound, everything seems forced, you're you're trying to do a little too much extra. When you do that, the ball probably doesn't go where you want it to go, and the changeup doesn't have that that it factor to it, and now you're in a big-time funk and sniffing the iron pigs. He's probably going to have another Connor Brogdon type year, meaning we'll like him for a month, and then he'll be gross, and we'll boo him, and then he'll get sent down, and then someone might get injured, and then you're going to have to do something else. All right, here's Connor Brogdon, whatever. I, I, I don't know. Actually, I believe, now that I say that, I believe Connor Brogdon doesn't have any more assignments. So, let's see. Connor Brogdon. Let's see if he can be sent down, because I don't think he can. Yeah, he's out of options. So, hey. I'll, uh, shut up, you idiot. <laughs> Fucking idiot. That's right. I deserve that. I'm sorry. I apologize. I mean, come on now. God damn it. I'm such a dope. All right, let's get to the big debate of what was my Saturday radio show. And it kind of happened organically. I believe a caller just called in talking about the division. Now, let me be very clear here. For many, many years of my life, after the Chase Utley, Ryan Howard years, the Cole Hamels, the Jimmy Rollins years, I want to make sure everybody gets their love there. (laughs) The Chooch years, the Charlie Manuel years, the Joe Blanton years. Can I say that? After the fun, it became one of the worst baseball times of my life. Each year, we were hoping that they'd be able to break the streak of this not getting into the playoff lifestyle. We are finally in a position now Well, making the playoffs isn't obvious. They are making the playoffs. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
They are making the playoffs. They should be making a serious deep run. No questions asked. We'll see about the deep run, but they're making the playoffs. The reason I bring this up is we have all week to anticipate opening day. And what I'm about to bring up is definitely jumping too many steps forward. But when you are out of the Cesar Hernandez, Carlos Santana swinging his baseball bat at television screens and Gabe Kapler, now that you are actually solid, it puts you in a position where you could have these type of conversations with the anticipation of opening day, getting excited, the juices flowing, picturing Bryce Harper and that hair. Hey, he played first base. He was able to get some spring training action, so we'll put that on the side burner for now until the back stuff happens because inevitably there will probably be a little bit of time where he's dealing with something because that's just what happens with Bryce Harper now. But he also comes up clutch as hell no matter what he's dealing with. I saw a graphic the other day, MLB's throwing around about his numbers in the postseason and how he's been able to go to work. Oh yeah, that's with one one UCL. The guy's got a UCL and, it, and it's torn. Dude's t- torn UCL and he's out there molly whopping people. It, it's outrageous. That's beautiful. So, whatever. We'll slide past the back stuff for now because I saw him over at first base. I saw him up at the dish. I was able to take some deep breaths, and we move on for opening day. But you are able to sort of get a little outrageous with the topics leading up to opening day because we're talking fills all week. So, work with me here. I just sort of wanted to lay the groundwork prior to it because it gets to sort of a playoff discussion. That's what all that lead up was trying to get to there. So once again, garbage job by me. Here's the debate. Would you rather play in the wild card so you can have Mojo or win the division and have a bye? The amount of people that called in and said they prefer the wild card made me go nuts! Bananas! I was lost for words. I had to reset during the break. And my producer, Danny Ryan, who I love to death, he does an amazing job. He raises his hand in the producer studio. I think, all right, he wants to get his opinion in there and back me up because everybody with a brain understands that you take the division so you get a buy. You could set up your rotation. It's not automatic. You win that three-game series. And he raises his hand because he was just acknowledging that, yeah, I'm on that side. I prefer the wild card. How? How? How can you prefer the wild card? What does JT Real Muto do nonstop after every playoff win? He counts down the topper. Hey, topper, six more. Hey, topper, five more. Hey, topper, four more. What's he doing? He's counting down. I'm chopping off two wins of the countdown without even having to play. Right then and there. It's a no-brainer. Done. Done. Conversation done. Don't even need any more. But for some reason, we live in la-la land where, oh, but we have such streaky hitters. Everybody's a streaky hitter. All these Braves players, all the most dynamic offense. You want to know why it's different from the dynamic offense in the regular season and the postseason? Zach fucking Wheeler. Aaron fucking Nola. Because now you have playoff wheels going up against you with a killer mentality, doing all the research, all the tape study, all the tendencies, the studying, the attention to detail, the trends, what you like, what you don't like. I mean, it is so intensified that you beating up on 60% of the league that blows and you beat the Nationals, you beat the Mets, you beat whatever, the Oakland A's, none of that is relevant to facing Zach Wheeler in the NLDS at Citizens Bank Park. So because their manager, Brian Snitker, and the Dodgers manager, and, and Dave Roberts, because these guys are complaining about having three or four days off. They're making excuses. The Braves, prior to winning their most recent World Series, didn't win a World Series since 1995, the year I was born. I'm almost 30 years old. So prior to the most recent one, they were successful. My whole life, I know about the Braves being very strong. They're a well-ran organization, and they didn't win prior to the new format as a great team for majority of the time. Why? 
there was no bye week disadvantage then. There was no new format then. It was win your division, you're in the playoffs. And they had the one wild card team, the one game, and it keeps progressing, obviously. But the the point I bring up is the Dodgers. They won in what 1980 something, 1981, whatever it was in the in the 19. 19- 80s that was their last world series this new format is very new so they've been having great regular season success forever now and not being able to complete the job so because of a couple year window with this i need to automatically apply it to i don't want to get off time they all go through struggles it's not the phillies oh the phillies are the team that's super hot and super cold no Baseball players are super hot and super cold. You just don't care when it's the other team. You don't care when Juan Soto's in a slump. You don't care when Freddie Freeman's in a slump or Matt Olsen's in a slump or Acuna's in a slump. You don't care. You don't put any focus on it. But it happens all the time. Happens all the time. If the Phillies are as great as you think they are, and by the way, real quick, they played in the in the wild card these last few years, right? They didn't win the World Series. I mean, if it's that important for momentum, it's not. But if it is, their offense went quiet. It went goodbye. It fell asleep. But you played in the wild card. So I thought playing in the wild card is supposed to not give you the chance to go quiet. No, it's just execution. That's what it comes down to. If the Braves executed differently against Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola, if things worked out differently because of execution, then the Braves don't have anything to complain about. All the Phillies needed to do was not fall back into the trends of swinging at pitches super far out of the zone. That was their problem is their lack of attention. They're putting a lot of pressure on themselves, squeezing the bat too tight, trying to hit home runs left and right. That's also not going to go anywhere. I like the overall mentality in today's era to mash as much as humanly possible. I don't want them playing small ball. Small ball teams lose. They're not good. The Diamondbacks are not good. The Cleveland Guardians team from a couple, two years ago or so, it's like, oh, how are they doing that? They don't. They don't. They're going to end up coming up small because you don't have enough firepower. But when you go 160% on every swing and you're flailing at pitches on the outside part of the plate and Nick Castellanos and JT Real Muto look completely off, well, that's where we have to dial it back a little bit. Still shoot for the stars. Still look for your extension. Still absolutely be aggressive and pounce on pitches that are over the heart of the plate. But, you know, we got to do better at plate discipline. There, There is a way where you can still have the approach of mashing bombs, but don't be foolish. There's a middle ground here, and that's what happens when this team takes off to just go back to executing better. That's what it comes down to. And the few days off, well, guys are really messing up their timing. Stop. It's an excuse. The Houston Astros had no trouble doing it. They beat us in the World Series. Why? Because you're not Alvarez against Jose Alvarado was miserable for us. I mean, Jordan Alvarez had time off. What was he able to do against Jose Alvarado? Okay, yeah, okay, let's not relive that. They're pitching at a no-hitter in the World Series, but they didn't play the wild card series. And this whole momentum thing, when they played the St. Louis Cardinals, that was the Cardinals having one of the most historic collapses out of their bullpen ever. Alec Bohm gets drilled. There was a dinky little bleeder by Gene Segura on the right side of the diamond. And there's plenty of ways, too, where this, hey, we've really got to see live pitching. There's ways to simulate this stuff, by the way. They're not just sitting on their ass for three or four days not doing anything. They're preparing themselves, and there are ways to do it. But let's look at a scenario where you win game one of a wild card series, one nothing. you have one hit, which was a solo shot, and then you struck out a bunch. But you won that game. Well, I'm, was that all about the offense just staying hot? No. No. You won the game one nothing. You had one hit. You had a homer. You won the game one nothing. Well, at that point, and in this hypothetical, I just, I just can't wrap my head around it because all these people that talk about the wild card, why it's better because your time. Stop. Stop at the timing. Uh, you just automatically write them into winning the three-game series. You could very well lose that three-game series. 
I use the NFL as the example. Week 18, you already have the number one spot solidified in the NFC. So you you let your guys rest week 18 because you don't want to put them in harm's way. Then you don't play the wild card round because you have a bye. So now it will be three weeks. It'll be your week of week 18. It'll be your wild card week. And that will be your week leading up to that first playoff game. You're not playing football at all. Would you want them to go out and play because you'd be afraid of losing Mojo? They didn't even really have Mojo heading into that St. Louis series, if you remember. They backed themselves into the playoffs. We didn't really think that we even liked the team, their personality at all. It was really atrocious. We despised who they were. But then they got in and they they flukily won that St. Louis Cardinals series. And then they went on this run. But they weren't hot. They, They weren't hot as a team. At, at the time of getting into the playoffs, then this crazy little fluke gap, and say you go to the World Series. So this whole, like, you need to be so hot. And, oh, man, if you cool down because you don't play in the wild card game. No, chop off as many wins for free as you can. And this also went right into the discussion of, okay, well, what would be uh, solid is, Let's say it goes three games and then you have to use someone else other than Zach Wheeler in game one of a series in the NLDS. I had callers say they preferred a world where Zach Wheeler got the pitch in the wild card, wasn't ready for game one, so then we can set Zach Wheeler up against their second pitcher game two and put you at advantage with Aaron Nola in game three because obviously they're going to rest their starters and have everyone rolling from one through three for games one through three, whoever your opponent is, right? I fucking hate that. Hey, you know what that is? That's soft. That's baby crap is what it is. Why not try and win game one? Let's use the Yankees as an example with the healthy Garrett Cole. I want Wheeler facing Garrett Cole in game one. I, like, Isn't that what you want as a competitor, as an athlete? You're just punting game one? And it's like, well, no, because Ranger Suarez can outduel Garrett Cole. Yeah, I think Ranger Suarez can hold his own against a lot of great pitchers for sure. But what if you could beat Garrett Cole? Imagine taking down the Yankees with Garrett Cole game one. Think about the energy you have for game two. You just took down their top horse. Think about taking their 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 testicles and squeezing it and twisting it, ripping their balls off and, and cutting the head off the snake. All right, that's what you're doing. I don't know how those two compare, but that was sort of the what I was trying to get at there. The same thing, you're chopping the head off the snake. Not applying that to the same conversation of the testicles, please. Two totally different things. But, but come on, come on, what's up with this attitude? This this dumbass attitude of we don't want wild, or, or we don't want division wins anymore. We don't want bye weeks. Bye weeks are bad. Bye weeks are not bad. The Dodgers and Braves weren't good enough to win. That was your end. They weren't good enough to win. At the end of the day, they weren't good enough to win because they allowed for that to really sit in their heads so much. Uh, It affected them for whatever reason, whatever reason it is. So I want a division win, and I would like my number one pitcher to face other teams' number one pitchers, just in in general. I understand that if uh, the, the, the Phillies did win the division and then the team you're facing had to utilize their number one, maybe it wouldn't necessarily line up the same way, but it got to a hypothetical world where just in general, uh, how you uh, it, we got sidetracked, all right? The show obviously got geared into postseason Phillies baseball, but let's acknowledge that we can do that when we have a team that's as strong as this team is, so I, I'm going to take it from that angle more than anything else. I would like my ace to face other teams' aces because I like that attitude more. Can't back into stuff. Like, uh, hey, let's tiptoe into this. It's all right. Let's kind of dip our toe in. I'm not dipping toes in. All right, we're going balls deep. That's reality. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. It's it's a big Phillies week. You all know that. Appreciate all the love and support, and I'll see you all on the next one.